Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin our study here with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have together each morning as we open your word and we invite your spirit into our hearts, into our lives. We ask, Lord, that we can be directed by you, that we can be taught of you. And we are thankful, Lord, for the opportunities that you give us in reaching others, in the people that we meet, um, that you have prepared their hearts. And so, Lord, we pray that we will not neglect to take advantage of those opportunities, that we will recognize them, and that we can reveal your character in all that we do. Be with each person in their personal studies. And as we study together here, we invite again your spirit to speak to our hearts to correct us of errors, both in our personal lives and in our understanding of truth. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> uh, well, good morning again. Now, we were addressing some of the things regarding Islam and uh this jawbone of an ass. I can't remember the, Dwight had mentioned something, but I can't remember what it was. Um, but one of the things I want to look at here, just in verse 18, he was sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. This isn't something that we've really looked at particularly, but remember, um, Samson is a type of Christ. So when Christ says that he's, he's thirsty, um, how do we understand this in relationship to Judges 15? So I know you probably you, know this, but. you're connecting it to the cross. Yeah. Yeah. So so here in this story, I mean, we're going to be connected to the cross and we are also in chapter 16. So in, in this experience here, are, are we going to connect it to a cross? And if it is a cross, how do we how do we put this on a line? Because this is one of the details that people use to show that Samson is a type of Christ, this thirst. We could also connect it to the woman at the well in Samaria. Okay. Yeah, we can. Right. And in John 19, 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. So when when we look at this in uh, John 19, 28. Um, what scripture. We would we would take, we would look at Psalm 69, 21. And they gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink, right? So that would be the verse that we would look at. Can we also connect this to the story of Samson? I mean, obviously here they're going to offer him vinegar, right? Which is an alcoholic uh, uh, concoction. At least it was. So when we think of vinegar, what do we think of when we think of vinegar? Uh, 
Well, I remember Ellen White having a problem with it. Okay. So, so I've done some study on this and people could study it themselves. But when we think of wine, do we think, what do we think of when we think of wine? The alcohol. Okay. And we know that, that vinegar is, is derived from wine. But in this, this idea of vinegar, this wouldn't be what we would call vinegar today. So this would basically just be spoiled wine. Wine that's starting to turn into vinegar. Right. So with the Jews, they had a word for 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 different um, for grape juice, what we would call grape juice. That word was invented by Welches in the 1800s. So so that word never used to exist. You would just have wine. Right. And wine could be fermented or unfermented. In Bible times, what they did is during the grape harvest, they would take the grapes, they would press the grapes, get the, the blood of the grape out of it. They would then boil this down into a syrup, and they would store this in uh, um, jars, uh, usually by the banks of rivers, right? So where you have water to keep everything cool. And, and this, this is what they would reconstitute to make uh, what they would call wine, right? And, and you can still get this type of thing, this, this raisin juice. So it's basically just grape juice concentrate, right? Now it does ferment, right? In, in this, this process, there's some fermentation that takes place, but it's not what we would call French wines, the fine wines. This is something that was really developed much later. Um, uh, this whole process that we have of one increasing the alcohol content of wine, and and not allowing it to spoil to turn into vinegar. Right. So, um, so you know, part of the problem is these uh, these definitions of words would change. So, this vinegar would be highly alcoholic. It would basically just be. You know, wine that is spoiled, right? Um, and now, of course, you you can take um, you know apple cider and you can um, turn it into like apple juice. Turn it into apple cider. It's alcoholic. And if you keep allowing it to process, it eventually turns into apple cider vinegar. And um, the idea is that you're going to do this till all of the alcohol is consumed. Or almost all of the alcohol is consumed. So um, uh, when you get uh, like what we call white vinegar, um, that's that's just not using something like ap um, apple cider. So there's there is a little bit of alcohol in all vinegars. Some have more, or some have less. Uh, but the amount in it is no different. Uh, like if you had apple cider vinegar, it would be no different than uh, uh, the alcohol in juice. So if you have like apple juice, it's going to have alcohol in it. Even eating any fruit, all fruit has alcohol in it, uh, just in trace amounts. And that's what you would have in vinegar. So in Ellen White's day, when she talked about vinegar, vinegar was something that you made at home, and it was normally made from apple cider. It could be made from other things. You could make it from potatoes or, or other things like that or other types of, of things, but it would all have alcohol in it. So when she was talking about vinegar, it was actually something that had alcohol. So it'd be much more similar to what Jesus was offered, though his would have probably had more alcohol, uh, the vinegar that was offered to him. Um, so anyway, the point here is that this is going to be something to stupefy him, right? That is to relieve his pain, but Christ refused it. Now, why did he refuse it? Because of the alcohol content and because it was more of a painkiller. Right. Okay. So it was the painkiller, but does it symbolize anything? Yes. It symbolizes his, his affiliation with the Nazarites. Okay. 
So the Nazarites aren't going to have wine, right? Nothing from the vine. Okay. Now, I mean, Christ isn't really truly a Nazarite, right? He's from Nazareth. It's not really. Yeah, I get that. But isn't he symbolic uh, to Samson and Samson was Nazarite? So Samson is a Nazarite and he typifies Christ. And so, so his thirst, yeah. So that's why I'm saying that we can connect this thirst of Samson to this thirst of Christ. And Christ is going to refuse um, this alcohol to stupefy him, right? So he's going to refuse it. Now, it says he received it here. He received the vinegar. Um, but we know that uh, from... Um, so this is John... Got, So go to the next one. And um, I know the spirit spirit of prophecy is clear that he doesn't take of it; he refuses it. But. Um, Can't find this here. Okay. I'll have to look at that up later, but um, it might just be in the spirit of prophecy where he refuses the vinegar. So here it says he received the vinegar. It's Matthew 5, 6. That, well, that's, yeah, that's just dealing that blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Um, so when we look at Judges 15 here, and we look at this thirst of Samson, I'm saying that this is bringing us to Christ. Um, and then he doesn't want to die for thirst, right? He says, now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? And then we also have the cross here because I'm taking what, but God clave and hollow place that was in the jaw and there came water there out. And, and we can also see this um, with the spear that went into Christ's side, Right. Because you had blood and water that came out. Correct? And then you can also equate this um, to Christ taking this cup. Because it says when he had drunk, his spirit came again and he revived. So we can see that, you know, Christ died on the cross and he was resurrected. So am, am I making a stretch here connecting these verses to the cross of Christ, or does this make sense? So I'm going to ask another question. In our lines we have this idea of a cross. Now, um, now people remember Mark Bruce, at least some of you would. And do you remember the issue of why, why Mark Bruce and Jeff had a problem? Like the theological issue, not the personal issues. Does anybody know what was going on with Mark Bruce, what he was teaching. Anybody know? Was it to do with midnight? Okay, so this, this had to do with midnight. And he saw midnight as a cross, correct?
Right. And he was, and, and I'm trying to remember exactly how he did it, but he would take 10 days, right? So they had this 10 and then they divided it into three and seven and they put the cross there uh, somewhere along this line. So I, I don't remember exactly how he did it. Now, so there was, in my view, I, I think that there were some things that Mark Bruce was doing that were were correct. Um, but of course, you know, other things got in the way. So I personally think that, you know, they should have studied with Mark Bruce longer. Uh, there was things going on as far as how things were being represented. Um, and, and definitely there was problems with Mark Bruce. So I'm not saying that, you know, it was without fault, but we kind of all are that have problems with us. We all have problems. And so Mark Bruce had some problems in how he communicated and, and also things in his personal life that he really needed to get uh, straightened out. But that being said, there was some truth there that uh, ended up getting buried. And, and this was partly because with Mark Bruce and Parminder, they were completely at odds with each other. So Parminder ended up winning that battle as far as gaining Jeff's favor while Mark Bruce uh, was pushed out. So this, this was you know, happening in 2016 into 2017. Um, so you know, God's counsel wasn't being followed on how to study together. Um, people's personal problems uh, ended up becoming the issues rather than studying God's word from my limited perspective and knowledge of what happened. So that's just my opinion, whether I don't know all the things that went on. So I can't say much beyond that, except that there was a conflict on how we were looking at the lines and, and Mark Bruce had some light on that. So, um, but those clashed with Parminder's ideas. So Parminder's ideas came into the front. My understanding yeah. was that the uh, Jeff was saying that uh, Mark Bruce was like a peace and safety message concerning midnight. Yes, but I don't think that Jeff was correct. Um, I mean, he was partly correct because Mark Bruce was addressing nine eleven. See, this was this was part of the problem. Is we were on different lines. And, and if we had taken the time to follow God's counsel, I think we would have been able to sort it out. Instead, we had to get involved in all the stuff that we got involved in. Um, so Mark Bruce was saying that, um, that the role of 9-11 was different, that uh, I can't remember exactly how, how he put it. Um, but, but I think he was correct, in, at least in part, in that, but it's because we hadn't had the various lines sorted out, and we were moving along these lines, but we didn't know what line we were in. And, and that's why I think those problems arose. So, so there was a difference of view. The same thing happened also with uh, Chawatu. So Chawatu recognized that 2014 had this role of what he called sunset and that sunset would be equivalent to April 19th, 1844, if midnight is July 21st. And so he said, well, we can't have 9-11 as being, you know, the first day of the first month. But again, he's on a different line, right? So until we get these lines straightened, straightened out, uh, we're going to have these differences of understanding because we just don't understand it completely. And when you don't understand something completely, when you have a difference of opinion, when you're seeing something, uh, the thing that you don't want to do is just push aside um, what somebody's saying because there's things that you don't agree with. What you want to do is you want to examine it and look at it carefully and not misrepresent it and and there's this natural tendency in human beings that when there's something that we don't understand uh, that we we 
we'll tend to, pre- well, we pretend we understand what somebody's saying. So if I don't understand what somebody's saying in the first place, how can I know that it's error, right? I mean, that's, that's just a very simple thing. If I don't understand their position, I can't tell you that it's not correct. And I, and I can't say, well, it rejects something that we already understand because it may not be rejecting something we already understand. I may just think it does. Right? Because, because I don't even understand what they're saying. So how can I say what the, what the result of what they're saying is going to be? And also, there may be error in it. Right. But we know that Satan wants us to uh, not look at some light by mixing it with air. So he makes that light attractive that or that error attractive by mixing it with light. But also sometimes there's something we need to see. And so. That he wants us not to see. So he mixes it with air. So so we have to be really, really careful in that that regard. Um. But anyway, I bring up Mark Bruce idea because when we look at the idea of the cross, I mean, we haven't really, we, we, we place it where, where do we place the cross in, in a line? No, well, I mean, I don't understand your question. Uh, if you look at the chart, it's in the middle. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, so, but so my my question to you is: is what exactly do you mean by uh, where do we replace where do we place Christ on a line or the well, cross on a line? The cross on a line wouldn't it be the center of a chiasm? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. And that center of a chiasm. In Millerite history, where is the center of the chiasm that we generally look at? What's the primary chiasm in Millerite history? I mean, we have three of them, but two of them are in Snow's letters. So the one that's not in Snow's letters Well, I think the uh, first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month, the, the midnight in the middle or midway. Right. So, right. So we have midway. So that's that's going to be midnight, right? Now, some of this goes to my study that for this afternoon, but. Um, so, so the cross is midnight. So this was the problem that Mark Bruce was having is that we didn't have well-defined where we're going to place midnight as far as its relation to these lines, right? So, so I think there were some things he was doing that was wrong, but he was getting the right idea that that 911 because we've in doing these lines we've moved line 911 over to November 9th in a sense i mean didn't we with our 777 structure doesn't doesn't November 9th kind of become 911 y- yes okay so so none of that is denying 911 but back then in 2016, we didn't have enough to really understand what it, it was we were seeing. Now, unfortunately, you know, people's personalities got in the way and people became personally hurt and offended. I mean, the whole thing to do is if you have truth, if God is showing you something, it's it's God, God shows it to you for a reason, and you have to trust that that it's if it's true, that God's going to take care of that truth. He doesn't need you. I mean, that's the mistake A.T. Jones made, even though he initially he was trusting that God was going to take care of his truth. But as time went on, um, 
he got impatient and and started to take these things personally, right? So if you look at the 1893 General Conference sermons, Jones has it right. But by the time he gets to 1909 and they've taken away his credentials, or you could even say 1905, uh, I mean, Jones starts becoming impatient and, and the attacks upon his character, the misrepresentations, the twisting of the spirit of prophecy, all these things, and of course, Kellogg, and what's happening with Kellogg, all those things get Jones caught up in the drama of things, and that detracts him from the message. It, it, it hinders the message. So, you know, so if something is true, and and we, we need to allow that it's it's true and that God's going to take care of it. And so I think those are the mistakes that people like Mark Bruce made. If he really believed something was true, he could have been more patient. He could have just, well, this is true. Just because people don't accept it now, I'm not going to push the issue. I'm going to allow things to unfold so that people eventually will see that it's true. But there is the, the natural human tendency. You see something is true and you want to push it, right? You, you want people to accept it. And, and if self gets in the way, then you're just going to hinder that truth. You know, and I tell you, it's not, it's not easy to just trust that God's going to take care of things when you see that everything's wrong. And so then if we're going to look at this cross idea, um, isn't the cross tied up with that to some degree? Isn't Christ showing us the way? In spite of what he sees, what does Christ do? Does he see a way out of the dilemma, out of the problem? In, in everything uh, he's feeling... I don't think I don't think he does. I mean, he might have thought of it, but I, I don't know the mind of God. But. <laughs> the only thing that he sees is the cross. That is the only solution to everything. Right? That's what I'm thinking. You can't push aside that cup, you know, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, he prays three times, let this cup pass if it be possible. But, you know, he drinks that cup. Steps the cross. And I think that this, this um, when we start to look at these lines, um, in this, in the story of judges, I mean, we haven't, uh, we haven't really addressed the cross uh, too much, but here I think we see it quite clearly. We definitely see it in Judges chapter 16. But we, we've seen it also in the other places. We just didn't call it the cross, but it becomes the center of a chiasm, not necessarily uh, chronologically, but thematically, it becomes the cross. It's the point at where, where um, the decision is demonstrated to some degree. Now, the other thing about midnight, midnight and midnight cry are really the same way, Mark. They, they show up at different times. But we know the midnight cry was given at midnight. It was given on July 21st, 1844. It just wasn't empowered until August 15th. That's where, you know, everybody got it. It just, not everybody got it on July 21st. Some people did, of course, because those people were at the camp meeting, some of them, in, um, in on August 15th. And, and so we have this, even in Adventist understanding, these two dates are conflated. So the events that happen in Boston are placed on August 15th, some of them, like Samuel Snow riding up on a horse, for instance, that wouldn't have happened in, um, at Exeter. It only happened at Boston. So these, these stories got confused. And, and only this movement has sorted this out. Right. No one else has, has understood what happened. So, 
so this these events, midnight and the midnight cry. Um, how would we sort these out as far as in the life of Christ? So we got midnight, which is the cross. Well, where's the midnight cry? I mean, we we say, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Different things like this, we could we could place those as the midnight cry. But what's the difference between midnight and the midnight cry? They're the same way mark because they're doubled. They're they're that way mark, midnight and the midnight cry. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, the doubling. So how do we understand them as the cross? How do we understand these waymarks? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, so let's go here. Now, in this line, so this was this was um, the beginning of. We took the end of chapter fourteen, or the chapter fourteen, and at the end we had this, and at the beginning of chapter fifteen we placed this line. Right, so we dealt with the three hundred foxes, but now we're moving on in this story, and we're saying that um, that story moves to something else, and this is go going to. Um, deal with Samson's revenge, right? And that, um, and Samson said unto them, though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt on the top of the rock, Eton. Now, we know that this is the midnight cry. So we're taking uh, Judges 15, 8, and we're going to make this the center. Right, so I'm just going to grab one of these way mark things. Okay, so if I'm going to put one of these on, on a line, I'm not going to be, I'm just going to put it in the center here and I'm going to change this. So. I'm not saying November 9th is the center here of this. Okay, so we got Judges 15.8, and I'm saying that this is the center of this line, whatever line it is we're drawing. So where do we put this on our line? Judges 15, 8. What date are we going to place this at? Because remember, we said the Judges 15, 8 tied us back to, to 9, 11, right? Is that what we understood? In, in all these symbols, the great slaughter. Yeah, thought hopping proposed. What's what's that? We had said that, yes. Yeah, okay. So, but couldn't we put July 18 here?
this one. Now, if I was going to do that, so I'm, we're just doing thought experiments here. We're just trial and error. Or, or could we do this? Judges 15, 18. Now, we have this other symbol of the covenant, right? So remember 158 BC? So do people understand what I'm trying to do here, what I'm suggesting? And why would I put the great slaughter at July 18, 2020? Because no great slaughter occurred. Well, a great slaughter was predicted. Right. So great slaughter was predicted. Okay. Now, if we're going to take, so remember with July 18th, of course, we had July 18th was the prediction before midnight. Right, so it's three days before midnight from Samuel Snow's letters. Can we say the Judges 15 is a prediction before midnight? Theodore? Yeah. 18, wouldn't that be a disappointment? Judges 15, 18. Okay, can you explain what you mean by that? Which is, thou hast given this great deliverance into the hands of thy servants, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Okay. That idea would constitute a disappointment, wouldn't it? Okay. Yeah. Well, do we have a disappointment at the cross? The disciples was disappointment. Yeah. I would disappointment. say so. Yeah. Okay. So, so I don't have all the answers to this. It's just that when I look at Judges 15, the latter part of it, so basically verse 8. Um, well, you know, could go past verse 18. Uh, because we know the Judges 15 is going to have these other verses about the jaw. So we're taking 15 verse 18 to 20. Judges 15 verse 18 to 20, I guess, is that, that part of it. Um. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to to address this line? Because I think the focus of this is really just about July 18. Now, of course, July 18 is part of a structure. But couldn't we take this latter part of Judges 15 and just apply it all to July 18? But July 18th is the prediction before midnight. Well, do you have a do you have a reviving a spirit at July 18? Well, okay, so July 18, 1844, right? It's the, the 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 article that's published on July 18 is called Confirming the Covenant. Right? So it is about the cross. All right. You know, midnight is going to be three days later, right? July 21st, he's going to be at Boston. So, so he writes this article on, um, actually on June 29th is when he writes this article. 
it's not going to be published until July 18th. Right, because he, he writes an article, let me think, how's that go? So he writes an article on um, June 22nd, that's the Pentecost date, and then it's going to be published on uh, June 27th, five days later, right? And then he writes another article on June 29th, but they're not going to publish that article till July 18th for some reason. Why it took them that long to publish the letter, I have no idea. But it's not published till July 18. And um, based upon the publishment of that July 18, um, uh, let, or the letter on July 18, so the June 29th letter is published July 18, he's going to be invited to speak in Boston. And, and so how long it takes him to get there, he, it would be quite a journey by horse. So he's going to ride from... Uh, I can't remember where he's from, but it, it's it's basically that's why he drive rides up on a horse to Boston, not to Exeter, because it. Uh, my understanding is Exeter. He's there, um, the whole day. He gets there in the morning. He's there the whole day. He's not. Um, it's not really an issue. And this is going to be later in the day, from taking all of the accounts, that um. Bates is going to be speaking. So, so anyway, we know that there's this, this three days between the publishment of the confirming the covenant and him standing at Boston declaring that it's midnight and that he's giving the midnight cry and that they're midway between their disappointment and um, the prediction that he has, which is the 10th day of the seventh month. But I'm saying that this is also also a cross, because the cross has three days involved in it too, as a symbol, right? So, so what is this about? What is this? What is this experience of Samson? How does it relate to the cross, to Christ, and how does it relate to this movement? And how should we understand what's being told to us by this example? Okay, so cross with the Sunday law, thirst for God will be stronger during persecution. I'm not putting it there. I'm putting this story as we're making the application. I'm placing it in our history not something in the future. Because if, if I place it as July 18, is July 18 a cross in some line? Yes. Okay. It, it was a cross for us. And, and the question is, did we thirst? Agreed. Okay. And if and and God has given us, uh, I mean, there was an option that was given us, which was, of course, this vinegar, which is a, a fermented wine that has gone bad, right? Now, of course, it can also represent a disappointment to some degree as well. So we know that with this cross is a disappointment. We experienced a disappointment. So, so now we have July 18th. Now, this is the prediction before midnight. Right, July 18th is the prediction before midnight. And, and prior to July 18th, of course, we have November 9th. So, I mean, can we say that this whole, that, that this is all about that structure, that 777 structure at Worcester, Massachusetts at the time of Midway? Right. So he's living in Worcester and he's actually going to you know, be leaving Worcester. So he has to get to Boston from Worcester. 
and I tried to figure out how long that would take. Um, by horse, he would have to be riding on a horse to get from Worcester to Boston. And um, he'd have to be riding pretty fast. So, you know, he's not going to be, you know, just walking a horse. He's going to be, be riding. And um, so, so that's why I believe he came on the horse there. But the story's confused because uh, Lothborough puts it in July that they're at Exeter. Of course, they're not in Exeter till August. So I think he got it confused. But anyway, you can read the paper on that. Um, they pronounce it Wooster? Yes, they do. Well, it's just like uh, we pronounce Toronto, you know, which is uh, in Ontario. We pr pronounce it Trana. But this is an East Coast thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't suggest that you pronounce it Trana or Wooster. But anyway. <laughs> so anyway, Worcester, you've got this. Um, he's going to leave this place. Now, he's on a horse. Is that significant? ties it with islam right so so th that's another reason why we we should understand that that it's actually he arrives on this horse in boston not in exeter and so we're going to take this then here's here's the way that i would do it um maybe this is a better way to do it He's going to put this over here. I'm going to make this Judges 15.8, and I'm going to make this November 9th. So do it that way. Okay, so we're going to take Judges 15.8. And we're going to take this all as representing uh, the 777 structure. So if we're going to look at the 777 structure, uh, just that those 777 days, um, um, we would make this... Uh, Can we make this represent the three days? And this is going to be, we we'll just put this as 1520. So in a sense, it's it's covering all this from Judges 15.8 to 1520. We could even, I mean, technically we could start this with the seventh. And, you know, we could put 15.8 and 18 here. So maybe we'll do it this way. Okay. Anybody got any ideas about, about this? So this is just an idea. It's not set in stone. Oops. So what are we doing here? Not sure. <laughs> okay, how about this?
So I'm taking verse 7, uh, where he says, And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you. After that I will cease. Right? So you're going to see then uh, 15 verse 8. That's going to be a symbol of the midnight cry. Right? He smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Um, now, of course, we could put that. that We're just taking this whole thing as a line. Right? We're taking this whole line of 777. And we're reducing it down to July 18, 2020. And, and can we see the 7, 18, 20? July 18, 20 there. With these verses. Just of how I've written them. And that we can, we can then say that in zooming into July 18, 20, are we zooming into these three days? That is, or if we zoom out, right? If we're going to zoom out, right? Isn't July 18, 20 the, the symbol of really what 777 is about? Yeah, I thought that's what we determined. Yeah, okay. It's not, you know, physically the center. But it is physically the center if we put March uh, 27th, um, 2021 in there. Uh, it's the, physically the center between those two dates, right? Because that's that 327 date. Well, there's, yeah. So there's 252 days to, from November 9th to July 18th and 252 days from July 18th to March 27th, 2020 or 2021, pardon me. And then we know that the March 27th, 2021 is tied to March 27th, 2019 with March 27th, 2020 in the center. And that's gonna be the beginning of the 100 days of prayer, right? So I mean, we could fill in this structure with a lot of detail. Um, but I'm trying to say that this is about our experience in this movement from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. And this is about everything that we were to learn. That is, this is the prediction before midnight. But the pre prediction before midnight uh, typifies and gives information about October 22nd, 1844, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so Samuel Snow's letters. Um, so Angela put some verses there. Judges fifteen eighteen with First Kings nineteen ten. Okay. So First Kings nineteen verse ten. And he said, "I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant." Throw down, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Yeah, so that's a good parallel. Because one is, did we not... Um, you know, take the story of Elijah and tie it to, to this history... To our history. Now, of course, this isn't Mount Carmel in Judges 19.10, but um, we can even see, and we haven't actually put the story of Elijah on a line and shown the, the different, how that line works and how the we could zoom into different waymarks because we haven't got uh, to Elijah yet. So when I say that Judges 15, verse 7 to 20, is a repeat and enlarge of, of the story of Samson, in some ways it's just a focus. It's a focus upon the experience of what's being typified there. That is, Samson typifies Christ, but we've experienced something in this movement in regard to July 18th 
that should have taught us about what's to come. So we were expecting these actual events to occur as if we could predict actual events. Now, we have this problem is that we still want to predict actual events. We may not tie them to an actual date. That is, like Colin, for instance, didn't want to put uh, January 11th, uh, 2022 on his line, even though he should have, right? If we followed his logic all the way through, he should have given us those dates, right? 2023, you mean? Yeah, 2023. Yeah, so 2023. He didn't. He didn't put that there, right? And he That's he didn't, and he didn't put December 25th, 2022, in in the way that we did, right? So he has it there as this echo, um, but he didn't want to to put it on on a line. And as a date, right? He just wanted to put uh, whatever it was, November 8th, uh, 2022 for the election. He gets to there, but he's not gonna put the 65 days at the end. So um, the 46 and the 19 days. <clears throat> okay, so. So now we have this, this line, and so we can call this the prediction before midnight, that what we have experienced is the prediction before midnight. So the next thing that we have in our line, it, as far as we understand it, is midnight is coming. And the only thing that we really have to show that is that April 5th, 2030 date whether it's literal, that that's when midnight begins, which I doubt it, but we don't know what it means, right? We just know that it's it's a date far in the future and that it symbolically relates to the, our structures. It gives us information about where we are. But I would say that at least symbolically represents midnight, that we're approaching something, that we've experienced something in our history in connection with July 18th and November 9th and December 25th that is telling us information. And, and Judges 16 is going to tell us this information again, but in a different way. And we can see that his experience here is going to be typifying what's gonna happen later, right? Because, and we see, see some of this, what about how is he bound? He's bound with these two cords, right? Okay, so Colin said last night he wants to know what you're thinking and to study with you, and that we should. Well, that's great. Yeah. Because <clears throat> um, that's what we have to do. We definitely need to study together. And, you know, my pref preference is to study together as a whole group, right? That's what I think should happen. <clears throat> Yeah, he said that too, but he said, I wish I knew what Theodore is thinking. You know, I wish he let me know what he's thinking, and we should all be studying these lines together. Yeah, well, good. Because that's what we need to do. I mean, so. So when was that? I kind of left a little early. Yeah, I left about last, last night. Yeah. Was that during his six o'clock study? It, it was when it was closed. I pretty sure it's probably around eight o'clock last night i'm just guessing okay because you normally he has I mean, a I didn't study at six. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah i was at the study at six from uh, i was there from six to about seven thirty <clears throat> or eight or something like that i can't remember exactly when i left but it was after seven thirty. but i didn't stay till the end because i had some things to do um so um but anyway, that's that's good news because we definitely need to study this out because we don't know it all. 
right? We don't know everything that's happening. Right? We know what God has shown us. We know about July 18th, that July 18th is the prediction before midnight. That our experience, if we're going to put it into Millerite history, is the three days before Boston, right? That's what our experience has been. And now we're coming to Boston, that is, we're coming to midnight, but we're not there yet. So how would we apply the three days, though? I just, well, I just, we it in that's lots what of I'm having trouble with. Well, it's definitely not, it's not a, we're not applying it as a period of time. Right. We're not we're not saying that, you know, three. Yeah, days. It, it's a symbol. It doesn't have to be time. It's a symbol. Right. So so we applied it in the story of Ezra because you have the three days right leading up to. This, if you want to call it in some ways, it's it's the upper room experience, too, from the cross. Right. How do you relate that? Well, there's three days from the cross to the upper room. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. So on the third day, Christ is resurrected, but you also have the upper room where they first come to the upper room. But to get to their experience, they're going to have this period of 50 days, right? I mean, 49 days, but 50 inclusive days until uh, the Holy Spirit is poured out, right? Right. Right. So, so in the story of Ezra, that's going to be this period of the divorcement, right? So they come there, there's the great rain, right? On the 20th day of the ninth month, we take that as December 25th, 2021. But yet we know that the, the divorcement follows. And, and we have this period of time, which is this echo, this anniversary date, the 25th of December in 2022, right? Where um, you know, we're going to then begin this work of this, the line simply presented or whatever you want to call it, but uh, this invitation that's being made again, right? So we have a repeat. But then we have um, also the end of Colin's prediction, right? So we're taking that as the first day of the 10th month because December 25th, 2022 is the first day of the 10th month. And then typically, um, January 11th is going to uh, fulfill that role as well to the end of Colin's prediction. So the, the period of the divorcement, we're in that period now. Now in our lines, chronologically speaking, it brings us to the first day of the first month in 2030. But there's no reason that we have to say, well, it's going to be 2030 that that is fulfilled. Because it's just a, it's just a symbol, or it's at least a symbol, in that we can take, we can tie this to Millerite history, we can tie it to 457 BC. So we have all of these symbols. I mean, and it's kind of interesting too if you count the days from when Ezra leaves uh, Babylon on the first day of the first first month in 457 BC, and you count the number of days to April 5th, 2030. It's 13,000 and um, uh, not 13, yeah. Uh, it's 1,301,000 days. So it's 13, zero, and then it has 1,000 at the end. Is that, if that's right. Yeah. That's the number of days that it is. And what, what would be the significance of that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the number. So the number is 1,301,000. So it's 130 and 1,000, if you're going to write it out. 1,301,000. So we have 13, and we have 1,000. Right, 13 or 130, and then 1,000. That's from, you know, that's that's how we tie those dates together. So first day of the first month in 457 BC to the 
Oh, and that, actually, that's not 457, Part of me. I'm go actually going all the way back to the first day of the first month in 1533, Part of me. Uh, it's less when you do the other one. So if we go all the way back to 1533 BC, so that's the first time we have the first day of the first month, right? This shall be to you the beginning of months. You're going to count the month of Abib, um, the first day of that first month, where he gives them that. Uh, that's the first time they count the first month as the first month. And then we're going to go all the way to the first day of the first month in 2030. And it's 13, uh, well, I, I guess it's 1,301,000. 1,301,000. Well, what, what's the significance of that? As a symbol, uh, so 130 is the uh, prophetic days. 130 prophetic days uh, is 18,720 minutes. 130 is also related to Adam's age when Seth was born. Um, so we have the I number have no... of rebellion there. We have the symbol of July 18, 2020. Right? Say this to me again. We have the symbol of July 18, 2020 with the 13, right? Because if we take well, it as days. Yeah, if we see the 130, yeah. Right. Or even just 13 by itself. I mean, yeah, so yes. If you take 130, it ends up becoming um, 18720 minutes. Right. Okay. And then we have so 13, the number of rebellion, and that goes back to the, the 13 times... 144,000 gives us also that, um, right? So if you're going to take 144,000, because that's why there's 1,440 minutes in a day. That's why we get that symbol. But we get 1,872,000 days. And that's from the start of the Mayan calendar to uh, December uh, 21st, 2012, right? And then we get the first 777 days uh, going to my 52nd birthday, which 52 um, uh, 52 times uh, 360 ends up being 18720. So, so we get all of these symbols in here of July 18, 2020. We also have the thousand, right? So remember, Samson's going to kill a thousand Philistines with this jawbone of an ass. So they are tied together. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. So they're, they're tied together. But this is going to give us to this end of this, this structure. And this structure goes all the way back to the first time that they're given the first day of the first month. Right. Because before that, they never numbered the months. The Assyrians never numbered the months. Right. That was uh, we, that was uh, first mention, I believe. Yeah. Because, I mean, in the story of Noah, the months are numbered, but they're numbered in relationship to Noah's age, right? You know, the flood is going to happen in the sixth month. That's what we've determined. The second month of Noah's 600th year. But that second month is not the second month on the biblical calendar. That's not going to be given to them till later, right? And, and we know that the story of Genesis was written while Moses was in the wilderness, or not, not in the, but, you know, while he was the 40, before he was 80 years old, right? Before he brought Israel out of Egypt. So he'd written the book of Genesis, according to Ellen White. And so he didn't use, use a calendar that hadn't been given to him yet. And of course, in the story of Noah, they're counting those days in the 600th year of Noah's life. So, so that story of Noah is not going to be using the biblical calendar in that sense, right? 
the months are different months. So we, we determined that. Um, so yeah, the months are different, but the symbology is still there. Yeah, yeah. Though we know that the the tenth day of the second month in Noah's six hundredth year is October twenty second. 2391 BC, and it's the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. So, so the first time the door of the ark, the first time that we have a closed door, the door of the ark, that's going to be the 10th day of the seventh month, and it's going to be October 22nd. So, so it's pretty interesting that way. But now we go to these, these from the story of the Exodus, 1533 BC. And they're going to have the first day of the first month. And we counted the first day of the first month from 1844, right? 2,300 months, 186 years. But now we have this other count, which gives us also the July 18, 2020 symbols. I mean, and that's a pretty round number. Um, 13,000, uh, 1,301,000. 1,300,000. And 1,000, right? So, and the fact that we have those symbols there that tie us to the story of, of Samson, right? And to our history and to July 18th, I think is, is pretty significant, uh, whether everybody could follow all of that or not. Does that make sense to people? Anybody have questions about that? No, it, it, it makes a lot more sense now that we've talked this out. Okay. So, so we have a history here. So if we go to our July 18th, we can see that it must be connected with the first day of the first month in 2030. Right? Our history that we're in is connected to that date in the future. Whether that date's an actual real date in history will remain to be seen. But as a symbol, it ties us to that. So, so that date, another evidence for the date, April 5th, 2030, is this very round number of 1,301,000. Right? Yes. Because yeah, that's it's not something that you would likely have. I mean, to have these two dates that many days apart, it rounded off to 1,000. Right. I mean, that it, it is it's this round number of a thousand. We didn't round it off. You know, yeah, a lot of the numbers that we produce are, you know, nine digits and every one of them some different. Right. Yeah. So to have this this number, I think, is pretty, pretty significant. OK. And we also have in there the symbol of 300, because if you write it as, you know, how people used to write numbers, you have one million three hundred and 1,000, right? So we even have this story of the 300 in there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Now, um, now, the number itself is a prime number, and it's the 212th prime number. So does that mean anything? So that number 1301 is, right? Obviously, we put 1,000 on there. It's not a prime number. But when we reduce it to a prime number, it's the 212th prime number that is 1301. Is that significant? That number is rolling around in my head. I, I it, it, There's something there. I don't know what it is. Well, I usually connect it to a mirror. I usually connect it to 2012. It is a mirror, right? Um, I usually connect it to 2012. Now, um, that makes sense. That, and that's, of course, the Mayan, where the Mayan calendar starts, where we, we start this, that whether it's the end of the 13th back tune or however you count back tunes, um, but it's, it's the beginning of that. Odilio's presentation, which is the next one that I was going to mention, that's February 12th, 2022. 
So it would tie us to that February 12th date as well, right? Can you repeat that? February 12th, 2022. So Colin does his presentation on December 25th, 2021. And 49 days later, Odilio does his presentation on February 12th. <laughs> what was the name of his study? I, I don't mean to sidetrack you. What was the name of it? Sun, star, sun, moon, and stars or something like that? No, that's a different study. That was a different study. Okay. His was, um, uh, what was the title of that study? I've been searching for it inside my collection of stuff, and I don't seem to find it. Well, it's on my my uh, website. Academia site? Yeah, because I put the, the study there itself, the video. COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic in July 18, 2020 prediction. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm I sorry to distract you. Sun and Star's uh, uh, PDF there but uh, not the presentation. I had to put that pandemic uh, presentation there because it was uh, removed. So, so I put it there so people could see it. <clears throat> so that was February 12, 2022, right? So, so we can see that that, um, that number is also going to relate to our line again in that way. So it gives us 2012, but it also gives us 212. So it's all just agreeing with what we already understand. Okay. Any any other ideas on this? What you see in front of you? Does this? I mean, I don't, you know, we're talking about these past histories. We're not putting it on this line. But we can see that this is witness to, July 18th is witness to, because of its connection with April 5th, 2030. So this line is connected to April 5th, 2030, through all these things that have been happening in this movement. But it also ties us back to the first time we're given this calendar in this specific way that we're using, Right. So isn't it kind of interesting that, you know, the first time that they number the calendar, that, that we have this these symbols, and these symbols are derived from numbering of that calendar, right? Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So uh, any, anything else that we should, um, you know, I mean, I brought up the 158 uh, as being 158 BC, and we can see that there is this counterfeit, if we want to call it a counterfeit covenant. They make a covenant with uh, Rome, right? And, and of course, that's, they're not supposed to do that, right? And we tied that back to the covenant that they made with the Rechabites, Right, being 1,335 years apart. And, and so we can see that this is um, you know, this this in the story of Samson on the surface, you have this very unchrist-like figure, uh, but he's typifying Christ, but he's also typifying uh, this message. And so we know that we we get this um, this spirit that revives us. It comes from the study of these things, right? So, um, so there is the, this quote that um, William brought before the study to me. Just ask questions about it. But Ellen White says. In Review and Herald, April 4th, 1893, the events of the future will be discerned by prophecy and will be understood. So we know that we, as we pass through these events, as Ellen White says, other places, that light reflects back upon the past events, and these past events then 
shine light forward on our path into the future. That's to paraphrase. Um, so that we can see what's coming. And so, so we can see that this is what we have been doing. Okay, any, any more thoughts about something that we should look at here? I mean, we're tying this to the cross. We have this jaw. So we know that Islam is going to have a part to play again. But well, regarding Judges 15.8, I'm thinking of Jerob Jeroboam in 1 Kings 12, 31 to 32. I guess it's to 33 about the... 15th day of the eighth month there and this false covenant and calves. Right. So, yeah, so we have the, it's it's the 15th day of the eighth month that he's offering on the altar in Bethel. So again, we have that that symbol of 158. Um, and, and this is, of course, it, you know, it's a mixture of church and state. It's November 22nd. Um, you know, in 977 BC. Um, so there's all these different things. Oh, that's interesting. So, so if we look at, okay, that was kind of interesting. Uh, so Iran did something there, and I'll just show you what he did if I understand it correctly. So you're going to take the Mayan date, right? I'm just going to zoom in here a bit. So you're going to take the Mayan date as 13, 0, 0, 10, and 0. Did I do that right or did I do that wrong? No, I did that wrong. I got to go here. One, zero, zero. Correct? Yeah. Okay. And then we look at the Islamic date. It's going to be the 12th day of the second month. Kind of interesting, eh? That's December 16th, 2013. Yeah, I like the 212 there at the end. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. It's the 12th day of the ninth month, the day after 9-11, if, if you want to take it that way. Um, hmm. so that's pretty interesting. Now, technically speaking, uh, if you look at this date, it's exactly 360 days from, because that's what this one means here. This is one times 360, right? Because you've got 13, 0, 1, 0, 0. That's how they write out a mine date. This is um, 1,872,000 or 720,000 days since the start of the mine calendar. Um, and if you just had the zero, that would be, right, that would be uh, December 21st, 2012. So you put a one here, that's just bringing you 360 days later because this is. Uh, based on 20s, and these are based on groups of 18. So this is 18 times 20 is 360. So if I go here like this, I'm going to go 19, right? That's going to be the day before, right? So if I just move over one day, it changes to that number, right? Make sense? Maybe not everybody understands how. If you spend time with the, the calculator, you see how it works. Um, so again, that ties us to Odilio's date. 
and, and maybe in some ways, you know, we could take this and put Odilio's date in here, right? So all we would have to do I gotta go change here, so go back. Just get, I'll just put this as uh, okay, so we don't put that there. Just put this here. Okay, that makes sense. And then you have the 49 days in there. Okay, so thanks. That was really helpful. Okay, we, we have to close with prayer. Our time is up. We'll come back to this tomorrow. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the study today. And we just ask that you can continue to bless each person. Be with us in the study this afternoon um, as we look at the lines simply. And uh, help us to continue to understand, to study your words and to obey them. Forgive us for the time we have wasted. Help us to use our time wisely. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes.